Ideally, a scientific theory of mythology should be able to explain the genesis and specific content of ancient myth. Modern schools of myth, alas, have long since abandoned any pretense of addressing such questions, much less of offering comprehensive theories purporting to explain more than a handful of isolated mythological motifs from one particular culture. Stith Thompson's opinion is representative of the skepticism that currently prevails in the field. Quote, the ultimate origin of nearly all folk tales and myths must remain a mystery. The theory advanced by Dave Talbot and myself, in contrast, claims to offer a unifying explanation of nearly every globally attested mythological structure and thematic pattern. Our theory is distinguished from all other modern schools of myth, moreover, by the fact that it explains the individual myth themes at a level of detail rarely imagined by other scholars. The archetypal myth of the warrior goddess offers a case study in this regard. Among the earliest mythological traditions of Mesopotamia are those describing the planet Venus as the warrior goddess of Anna. Indeed, a third millennium Kenning describes war itself as the dance of Anana. In the following hymn, Anana is described as raining fire and flood from the sky. Quote, Loud thundering storm, high redoul, who makes heavens tremble, who makes the earth quake, who can soothe your heart? You pour down firebrands over the earthly orb, who flash like lightning over the highland, whose cry reaches heaven and earth, whose roar is all destructive. Your angry heart is a terrifying flood wave. Now I ask, would anyone viewing Venus in the present sky ever be inspired to describe it as a loud thundering storm, flashing lightning and hurling firebrands? Yet this very language is employed again and again in the Sumerian text to describe Anana Venus. Quote, like a dragon, you have deposited venom on the foreign lands, raining blazing fire down upon the land. You charge forward like a charging storm. You roar with the roaring storm. Your rage cannot be cooled. A recurring theme places Anana Venus at the center of a destructive heaven-spanning storm, described alternately as a tornado or a whirlwind. In a hymn to Anana, for example, Anana is described as clothed in a furious storm, a whirlwind. The word described as whirlwind here is Dalhuman, denoting a tornado or a dust cloud. Evident in these archaic traditions is an image of a planet gone amok its whirling tornado-like behavior instantiating its terrible rage. It is telling that analogous behavior is reported of other great goddesses, such as the Akkadian Ishtar, the Canaanite Ashtarte, the Egyptian Hathor, Ugaritic Anat, and the Indian Kali. Each of these warrior goddesses, several of whom are explicitly identified with the planet Venus, is associated with a destructive rampage at the dawn of time that brought the world to the very brink of destruction. If Anana was conceptualized as a whirling storm, Ishtar was represented as a whirling dancer. Quote, O valiant Ishtar, shining torch of heaven and earth, furious and irresistible onslaught, fiery glow that blazes against the enemy, who wreaks destruction on the fierce, dancing one, Ishtar. The epithet translated dancing one here is Gushea, literally the whirling one. Religious rituals celebrating Ishtar Venus featured frenzied dances in which the celebrants whirled wildly. Benjamin Foster, in his commentary on these archaic rituals, observed, quote, the whirling dance or mock combat the people perform as a memorial to Ishtar, here etymologized by the poet as the whirling dancer. From the standpoint of modern astronomy, needless to say, there is no conceivable reason why the planet Venus should be conceptualized as an agent of storm, much less as a whirling tornado. Nor, for that matter, is there any obvious reason why that planet should be described as a whirling dancer or fire-spewing warrior. Hence the profound puzzle presented by these widespread myths and rituals. How then is it possible to explain the myth of the warrior goddess? In the historical reconstruction offered by Talbot and myself, the myth in question encodes catastrophic natural events during which Venus's atmosphere became hypercharged and disturbed, flaring dramatically in the northern circumpolar heaven. The basic image was that of a whirling comet-like object or hair star. 
Indeed, ancient artworks from Mesopotamia, Old Europe, and the New World depict Venus as a whirling star. Such imagery is especially conspicuous in the indigenous traditions associated with the Hindu goddess Kali. According to the various accounts, the goddess's frenzied dancing threatened to destroy the world. Quote, the dread mother dances naked in the battlefield. Her lolling tongue burns like a red flame of fire. Her dark tresses fly in the sky, sweeping away sun and stars. Red streams of blood run from her cloud black limbs and the entire world trembles and cracks under her tread. A recurring theme in the Hindu accounts of Kali's rampage is the goddess's wildly disheveled hair, reputedly capable of raising a terrible storm that blocks out the light of the sun. The goddess's hair, as noted by David Kinsley, is a sign of her destructive nature. Quote, Kali's unbound hair may also have a broader, indeed cosmic significance, suggesting dissolution itself. Considering Kali's identification with the cremation ground and death, her loose hair may suggest the end of the world. Her hair has come apart and flies about every which way. Order has come to an end. All has returned to chaos. As we would understand this imagery, Venus's whirling hair not only presented the appearance of a giant comet or tornado circling about the polar axis, it was laden with lightning and fire and quite literally constituted a storm that blocked out the light of the primal sun. Hence the global myth of the giant comet or dragon that swallowed the sun and threatened to destroy the world. A Sumerian hymn from the second millennium BC captures this idea perfectly. Quote, my hair will whirl around in heaven for you like a hurricane. Students of myth will remember that Kali's dance was not a solo performance. She was joined by Shiva, whose dervish-like dancing added to the apocalyptic destruction. Shiva is Mars, as I have documented in various works. Analysis reveals that Mars features prominently in nearly every aspect of the myth of the warrior goddess. It was the tornado-like storm associated with Venus, in fact, which vacuumed up many miles of surface material for Mars, leaving the red planet with a severely flattened northern hemisphere. Doubtless, this immense dust cloud of recently catastrophically excavated material contributed much to Venus's archetypal status as an agent of destruction and whirling dust devil, not to mention her intimate association with a vast horde of demonic beings. Despite her many repulsive attributes, Kali remains India's most beloved goddess to this very day. Artworks depicting the raging goddess are ubiquitous, most emphasizing her disheveled hair and grotesquely protruding tongue. It is the goddess's tongue that remains the most iconic and lurid of all her ghastly features. Quote, Kali's tongue is a problem. It hangs, it lolls. One cannot help noticing it. In the famous temple of Kali in Southern Calcutta, the image of the goddess appears to be nothing but a tongue. The history of Kali's tongue, like the history of the goddess itself, is a story rich in detail but poor in plot. We know a great deal about what the tongue symbolized in specific contexts in different periods, but we know very little about how, why, or when the different meanings of the tongue developed. How then would we explain Kali's gigantic tongue? The fact that warrior goddesses from the New World likewise display a protruding tongue attest the archetypal nature of the imagery in question, as does the fact that cultures on both sides of the Atlantic explicitly compare the goddess's tongue to a dagger or knife. Here too, it is our opinion that the imagery encodes the unique relationship prevailing between Mars and Venus during a specific phase in the history of the polar configuration, in which Mars appeared to move below Venus towards Earth, presenting the appearance of a dagger-like tongue. The fact that the red planet was described as the knife star or sword by sky watchers from early Mesopotamia or Egypt is certainly germane to our hypothesis.